Mix and match usage of uh, open source uh, technologies, Spark and Solar. Uh, I was originally going to do it on kind of a particular application of, 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 of blending the two together, and then I realized that there's a lot more you can do as I was doing it. Um, and so instead, I'm going to kind of work, walk through a little bit of a kind of a, a workflow I've got after I transitioned from uh, places with lots of infrastructure and lots of operational support um, to being in an environment where I don't have that anymore. And even if you're working at some place like Facebook or Twitter or Uber right now, um, maybe you won't be in a couple of years. So maybe remember that you may not always have the operational support you currently have and the infrastructural support you currently have. So think about what you would do if you wanted to go in as a new, you know, you, you've, you're, you've moved from being manager of data science somewhere to now being the CTO of a very small company and you're the one in charge of figuring out all that stuff with no infrastructure. Um, so, you know, yeah, this one doesn't work actually. Let's try that one. There we go. So just quick, um, many of you have seen me talk before, especially if you're local, um, but I was at Twitter a while ago. I was at LinkedIn. Most, most recently, I was at the Allen Institute for AI here in Seattle. Um, right now, I'm doing applied machine learning and data engineering R&D at uh, LucidWorks. Um, and so let's just kind of jump through. I'm going to help try to save time. Um, and not spend too much time on preliminaries. But, you know, imagine you, you, you've jumped out of your, your happy world of hop, operational support. You know, everyone's, you know, handling your HDFS cluster. Um, you have, you know, you can talk to HBase, you can talk to Cassandra, you can do whatever things you want to do. All the tools are available to you. Now you're in a new data lake. Um, you don't have that anymore. Um, what are the kind of things, what are the kind of problems you're going to have, and how are you going to, you know, show off your, your, your data science skills, your data engineering skills. The cold start problem for us um, as data scientists. You know, the, the question I want to ask is kind of, you know, what is your, your minimum viable big data science uh, toolkit? What exactly do you need to kind of get started and actually sh show off some of your skills, build some in initial demos, build, you know, proof of concept applications? Um, do you need a big scalable database? Do you need any database at all? Can you just work with flat files? Do you need to work with a distributed file system? If you don't, are you going to write a whole bunch of code that's got, you know, explicit file paths hidden in it and when you try to scale that out, you've got to work through all the strings and everything and you've got to change to hooking in APIs to talk to a NoSQL store? Um, what kind of m machine learning libraries do you need? Obviously, there's lots of them available, but what's kind of the minimum toolkit that can actually get things done? Um, if you're working with text or, or graph, do you actually have uh, text libraries, you know, text analysis libraries, or are you doing string splitting by just white space? Um, do you have graph libraries available? Kind of these are the sort of questions you had. You, you, I, I found myself, you know, asking myself, um, and not wanting to have a big pile of glue that I can get working on my laptop and I know I can scale it out, but then when I want to train a bunch of interns to work with me, I'm like, okay, you got to figure out how to use, you know, eight different systems, and by the time they're done learning of the basics, you know, their internship is over. It's great for them, but not so great for me. Um, so, sh short answer, you know, you, you've seen the title of the talk, you know, my, my, my basic, you know, pitch is going to be, you know, if you get nothing out of this and if you're getting hungry and you need the coffee, Spark plus Solar with just, you know, solar cloud, so you've got kind of Zookeeper hidden behind the scenes, is kind of, I'm going to say, the minimum viable kind of big data science, you know, uh, you know, set of products you need. If you have just those two together, you can do rapid iterations of prototyping. You can scale things out eventually. Um, but you've got kind of, you've got your built-in REPL. You've got all the things you need. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk through you know, brief, brief little overview, I'm going to talk about, you know, why, why do you need solar? You know, normally in many talks to search people, you know, I'll switch the order. I'll be like, why do you need Spark? And then, you know, remind people, yes, you love solar. Um, for this crowd, I'm going to say, well, why would you want, what, is, what does solar get for you? Um, and, and then why Spark? What do, they, what do they do for each other? And then I'll kind of do a walkthrough of a little bit of, of a kind of rapid workflow turnaround, uh, rapid turnaround workflow where you can kind of go back and forth from doing exploration, um, seeing how the data looks, and then, you know, doing a little bit of, uh, you know, data science and machine learning, whether it's unsupervised or supervised, um, and then kind of seeing the results of your actions as you go. Um, 
in a longer talk, I would actually kind of demo some of this stuff as you go, but some of it requires training, and even on small data sets, that's not going to go super fast. Um, and then at the end, I'll kind of talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how you can do the, the kind of the, the, I would say the, the, the main thing that looks awesomest with uh, Spark and Solar kind of together um, the, in terms of machine learning is doing recommenders. It's kind of the place where this just kind of shines. Um, so let's just jump ahead. There we go. So um, the two questions asked if you're going to say you're going to do data science with Spark and Solar is, you know, why does Spark need Solar and why does Solar need Spark? Um, so to start off, let's imagine you're back and in jumping into this data lake. Um, you're in a new environment. Maybe you've got HDFS hanging around, but you're going to say, okay, I'm going to look at some mail archives. I'm going to do a 20 news group style problem. Um, how do you start? You start by looking at it. You see the files. You're like, okay, I've got a bunch of LZO compressed part files from some Hadoop job somewhere. I want to see how I can do anything with that. Maybe you don't even have a schema. This is pretty common. You've just got files that are, maybe they're CSV. Maybe they're Avro, maybe they're protobuf. Maybe you've got to, you can't even really cat them. You can download the files. They're not too huge, each individual one. But actually just playing with it from a batch environment like HDFS is kind of a total pain. Um, you can't actually understand whether or not you've got missing data, whether you've got missing fields. The 90% of your time that's going to spend cleaning the data, um, you don't even really know where to start. You can start writing some batch jobs to kind of run over it, but then each one takes you whatever, 15, 20 minutes just to run it after you've written it and getting it to compile and know what your schema is is going to be, you know, depends on what kind of environment you've got. I would say that this is not the place where you'd want to do a lot of Spark work um, because it's just going to take a long time to get started to understand what, you, what your problems are. So what does Solar get for you? What if you, instead of taking um, that data that was there, you know, dump it to JSON, don't worry about the schema other than just giving it some sort of JSON schema um, and just load it all into Solar. Um, Solar will act as a key value store. It'll also act as a full text search. Um, it'll also give you aggregate statistics quickly because it's got faceting built in. So you can do fa faceting on basically all the fields that have ranges, any of the fields that have dates, uh, any of the fields that are numeric. Um, it'll let you just say, oh, okay, wait a second, I see that the, the average, you know, you get a histogram of the file length sizes of, of, the, of the, you know, the lines in your, in your directory. Um, the other nice thing about it is you don't actually need HDFS. Um, if, if, if you want to, you can actually just dump everything from wherever you got it originally. Maybe it's from a database, maybe it's from a Kafka stream, maybe it's from who knows where. Push it, push it all into, um, into Solar and then treat that as your source of record. It's a distributed system already. It can already handle, you know, failures. It's fault tolerant. Um, it's pretty fast. You can do bulk loading, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how you would do that um, in a minute. Um, plus, it's just kind of it's a full text search engine. It's got you know multilingual uh, text analysis kind of built in. Um, this kind of makes for doing things that involve text a, a, obviously a lot easier. Um, plus, it's a, it's a real-time REST layer on top of everything to start with. So you've got kind of a way to query it rapidly, um, both in kind of semi-batch, you know, faceting results, as well as kind of dig, diving into the, the, the query um, individual per document uh, investigation. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over this a little bit. There's lots of stuff that Solar can do that you, you don't even need for kind of doing basic data science. But... Um, some of the things that you may not know that it can do, or it can do, you know, it can it can respond to SQL. You can actually talk to it via uh, streaming SQL. Um, you can do grouping and join across tables, um, even though it's a distributed engine. It's not real. I wouldn't really call it a, a distributed database. It's not really a database. It is still kind of a NoSQL search engine. Um, but you can do a lot of the things that that you would want to do in a in a in a SQL database. Um, so. If you've got if you've got everything you know everything you need in 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 a solar index um, treated as a data store plus an index that you can search over, what do you need Spark for? Well, Spark is really at the end of the day, it's going to be useful for anything batch computational across your whole data set, anything global. Um, plus, building indices and kind of recomputing the index. If you want to, and once you've got it into Solar, and you want to kind of reprocess it because you've realized, oh, this whole field was actually a date field. I I, I, I saved it as a string because I didn't know what it was when I dumped it in from JSON. 
you want to reprocess, Spark can do that, um, and then push it right back into the same index. Um, plus, once you've got Spark, you've got all the things that come along with Spark, Spark ML, um, Graph, uh, GraphX, and so forth. Um, plus, it already comes with kind of connectors built into a lot of other data sources. So, sure, maybe you're, maybe you're working in solar right now, but if you want to read or write from HDFS or um, a database or HBase or Cassandra or whatever else, Solar's already, or um, actually, Solar's got some of the connectors for that, um, but also um, Spark has that as well, so you can kind of transfer things in and out. Um, you know, I think that's sort of what I was just saying right there. You know, so on the Solar side, you've got exploration, and you've got the ability to kind of drill down and kind of understand your aggregate, you know, high-level statistics, when you're missing data, when things are kind of ugly, um, when things are unbalanced. One of the things I did in kind of writing demos for a version of this talk was, you know, running Spark uh, k-means on my data without doing a lot of pre-processing. Without doing a lot of pre-processing on the data, it looked like it was converging really fast and it was awesome and great. And then I'm looking at it and all the, one of the, you know, clusters has like 98% of the data. And I'm like, okay, that wouldn't have been something I would have seen if I hadn't just kind of quickly just after I run the, ran the clustering, dumped it right back into solar, faceted on the cluster ID, boom, it shows up immediately. Um, so, example workflow of how I do this kind of thing now, now that I don't have a lot of operational support um, and I'm working with disparate data. I go into a new client, I wanna say, okay, hey, how do I, how can I help you with your e-commerce site or your um, fraud detection? Um, so, the, the, the workflow I'm going to talk about is, you know, we've open sourced this set of code that kind of ties together, um, you know, it, it gives you an RDD backed by a solar index, um, and then that will hook into, you know, our commercial product that you can still use for free if you're just kind of doing it for non-commercial stuff. Um, this product, that, this uh, open source product project that I'm talking about is Search Hub. It's a kind of 20 news groups plus plus style environment where you've got all the ASF um, mailing list archives that are open uh, available. Um, you can crawl it and you can, you know, suck in the, the GitHub from each of the open source pro ASF projects, the JIRA, and kind of start linking them all together. Use it as a practice data linkage project. Um, plus it's got effectively interaction data because you've got people commenting on GitHub issues, you've got people, um, the same email addresses linked to the mailing arc, mail, the mail, arch mail archives. Um, and so it's a kind of a nice play, uh, toy open data set that you can actually use and it's, the licensing is, you know, it's, it's Apache, so you can all use it. Um, so let's see. Um, so let's imagine you take this data set. You've got, um, um, mailing list archives plus GitHub and, 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 and Jira tickets, and you want to index them all into solar. You want to see how ugly they look to start with, because they're going to all look ugly. This is real data. Um, then you kind of want to play with it for a bit, um, do some clustering, do some, you know, graph analysis of the social network of the people that, you know, follow the, you know, follow the same issues in the mailing, li mailing lists and respond to the same GitHub and Jira tickets. Um, and then at the end of the day, you can also use this data as a, as a, as a, as a recommender playground. Um, but forgetting about the actual playground aspects of it, this is just, treat this as an example for, um, imagine you don't have a lot of infrastructure and you want to be able to do the kind of things like simple predictive analytics, unsupervised machine learning, and um, building recommenders with kind of minimal inputs and do it as quickly as you can. So, you know, kind of as I've said a couple times, what, you know, take away from this slide is, you know, the, the, the library we, we, we open sourced, the Spark Solar library, um, is kind of a library just to allow you to do, you know, once you've got Spark, you know, give it the, you know, little keyword on the format of solar and make sure you give it the, Z the zookeeper host of where your solar, what your solar is talking to, and Spark can just load up a data frame backed by that index. Um, it knows about locality of, of, of your nodes, so if you're co-locating your, um, your Spark nodes, your Spark workers with the solar index, it will actually know to talk to the same local index, um, less RPC. Um, and note that now you don't, you may have a couple different machines, but you don't even need to have HDFS anymore um, or S3 or whatever. You know, 
maybe I'll skip over this a little bit, but meant this short reminder that, you know, once you're living in the land of solar, um, you know, you really quickly can get really nice text analytics to kind of strip out, you know, if you want to do, you know, German language stemming together with, you know, engrams on your data as feature as, you know, initial features into some classifier, um, that's like three lines of Scala. Um, it already lives there. It's like, this is commercial grade text analytics um, and you've got it kind of living there. You don't need to worry about just, you know, string dot split on white space. Um, you've got a lot better than that. So let's say you've, you, you've kind of done your initial feature analysis. You see that you can do analysis on this data set. You've seen that, you know, now you've cleaned up the empty missing fields. You've kind of stripped out the bots. Um, you've, you've stripped out the spam. Um, you want to do some quick exploratory, um, you know, k-means or LDA or run word to vec on it. Um, you do that, typically in a, in a Spark workflow, you'll, you'll, you'll build your little model. You've got it sitting there maybe in the, in the Spark shell. And now you're, okay, what, how do I, I can play with it. I can ask for a few synonyms. I can look at the, the top terms in your, in your topics. And you're like, okay, now how, do, how does it fit with my real data set? Um, what I like to do now is just tack on another field onto your, 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 your data frame, write it back into solar, and now say, okay, can I see correlations between the LDA topics I associated with each of these documents and the k-means, you know, cluster IDs? Are they actually kind of learning the same sorts of things, or are they totally unrelated? Typically, they'll be unrelated, but maybe you'll see correlations you wouldn't have seen before because they're living, and you, now you can just, you know, do simple query params to say, you know, and cluster ID equals five, once you see that that's a particular cluster is interesting, and LDA topic, you know, equals 13, as faceting filters, and you kind of can see the list of results pretty much right, right away. Um, it kind of gives you a good feel for what's actually going on. Um, you know, let's say you're going, you know, to, to show that, like, you know, it's not just a toy playground. You can do, you know, you can obviously, this is Spark, you know, if, if you've done plenty of Spark stuff, you know, you know, Go to sleep. I'll forget about the next line slide. But you know, you can treat this kind of workbench as an environment where you're still doing real, actual, you know, supervised classification. You can actually do your full grid search. Here's, you know, the, the this is the page that shows that reminds me that uh, the environment may look the same uh, on your laptop when you're kind of doing this stuff for a proof of concept, but as if it was in production. But your hardware cares when you're doing a grid search over, you know, 500 different parameters and then you realize, oh, this is not going to complete anytime soon on my laptop. I actually do need to have a cluster here. Um, but point being, the same code will run in both places. You'll quickly realize when <laughs> you need to actually scale out. Um, so here's where I can, you know, uh, you know, say that I don't have enough pictures. People say I don't have enough pictures in my talks. So a couple of years ago, I, I painted, you know, this is, this is collaborative filtering acrylics. Uh, SVD on canvas with acrylics. Um, is the title of this piece. Um, but point being, you know, once you've got Spark ML, um, you've got kind of, you've got some basic collaborative filtering stuff you can do. Um, the nice thing about if you've got uh, solar as well, is once you build the model, you, you batch, you know, compute all the, the recommendations or maybe the item by item similarities, um, load them back into solar, you've got recommenders, you've got a service layer that already serves those recommendations already for you. Um, the nice thing is you can also now do mixed mode recommenders with that um, because you can do search over the items if there's text. You can recommend the items based on textual similarity. You can recommend them based on the collaborative filtering similarity. Um, and then with a simple query parameter, you can kind of interpolate between the two. That's really nice because you can kind of quickly see whether or not you're wor it's worth investing in doing a real mixed mode recommender. Or you see that right away as you've played around with it a bit, the, the parameter always says collaborative filtering is much better. Popularity and personalization is just much better than textual similarity. Maybe that's something that happens fairly often. Maybe if you're recommending, uh, you know, content that is highly textual or related, you know, Wikipedia articles, it's actually much more based on the text similarity. But you'll see that once you actually play around with it. Um, that was what should have been what was I was saying on this slide, so we'll go even faster through it. Excellent. Um, but point, point being is that, you know, 
being able to store them in, in a layer that you can serve them from and have that be your production layer, um, it's really nice to have a proof of concept be something that can also be something you would serve in production. Um, you'll obviously have to do some more tuning and, and, and work with it a little further, but the fact that you can actually do kind of A-B testing on this alpha parameter of tuning between the collaborative filtering field and the, the content-based similarity field, um, you know, maybe those are, you know, IDs of the, the fields that, um, of the items that are, you know, related to a given item um, that you've indexed into a separate field after, after you did this stuff in, in Spark and stored it back into Solar. Um, being able to do testing on your data, you know, this isn't necessarily, you know, I, you know, three years ago I would have said, oh, well, why would you want to do this? Once you've, once you've got these two different style, styles of similarity, I would want to learn a, you know, a joint decomposition that actually uses all the features from both, and then it would be, you know, it definitely better than if you just take the two together and then kind of linear sum together. Yeah, it'll be better, maybe like 2% better. How much more work is it going to get you to get that? It's a lot more work. You could write a paper on it if you're academic in the audience, um, but, you know, in production, you want something you can easily tune back and forth um, and just A-B test. Um, so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end early because we can, we can go eat. But um, you can get Spark Solar is just a, a, you know, you can Maven depend on it. It pull it on in. Um, it'll let you have this kind of solar RDD um, that lets you treat um, solar as your uh, kind of backing store for talking to Spark. Um, Search Hub is where we kind of have our little playground where you can actually see the stuff. It's going to be live as a site we're hosting where we're going to be kind of letting you explore the Apache world. Um, and we're going to use it as a place to you know, do kind of search relevance experiments as well as recommenders and things like that. Um, and uh, if you want to see how I use this, this we have our commercial product, Fusion, um, which kind of builds on top of Spark and Solar. You don't need to do all the stuff I talked about with that, but... It's easy because you download one thing. You don't need to now run your Maven compile that then pulls in the entire universe. You've got one big blob that just kind of starts. You do Fusion Start. It's running Spark. It's running Solar. It's running Zookeeper. It's all kind of up and running. Um, and it's, you know, something you can do. So thank you. <laughs>